Alhamdulillah, we have reached the month of Rajab. Uh, this year, unlike previous years, instead of one Ramadan, I tried to mark my own calendar with one Rajab. I think, Alhamdulillah, everywhere in the world it has entered, we have all entered the month of Rajab. And all of us should remember that Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam he taught us to make dua. And the two verbs in that dua, one is baraka. So may Allah ta'ala grant us baraka, Allahumma barik lana. But may Allah ta'ala grant us baraka in the month of Rajab and Sha'ban. And may Allah ta'ala make us reach, balighna, may Allah ta'ala make us reach the month of Ramadan. So interestingly, the du'a itself actually is nothing about in the month of Ramadan. It's about asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for barakat, blessings in the months of Rajab and Sha'ban and just reaching Ramadan. And this is, I would share with all of you, just because I personally experienced it, that this is the blessings of the guidance of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Just by putting one Rajab instead of one Ramadan, in other words, tracking, Obviously, we still track Ramadan because everyone will inshallah be more busy. And that's an important thing to put on your schedule, calendar, however you organize yourself as well. But putting a marker for the start of Rajab is very helpful. And it makes, I think, all of us in the world for many, many reasons, global reasons, maybe many people for individual reasons, need to prepare much earlier, much sooner, much better for the month of Ramadan. Now, because this year, inshallah, I'm hoping to, and I'm saying this live to all of you, only to bind myself. Uh, I'm hoping, inshallah, to complete uh, the second half of the uh, tafsir series on Quran that we had started last year in Ramadan, uh, inshallah. And that's also one reason why I needed to personally prepare uh, a little bit beforehand. But I was thinking, so in the course of you know, thinking about this, I came up with these ideas which I wanted to share with you today called Qur'an from the heart. First know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Qur'an al-Kareem has mentioned about Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down Qur'an ala qalbik on the qalb, on the spiritual heart of Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, just so you don't misunderstand, that's not going to happen to any one of us. That is wahi, that is only to the anbiya. But it is very important because number one, there are some people, whether due to their lack of knowledge of Islam or their wish to deliberately misrepresent Islam or a genuine mistake on their part, they say that the only way that Allah Ta'ala sent revelation was through Sayyidina Jibreel alayhi salam and specifically through the recitation of Sayyidina Jibreel alayhi salam. In other words, that would mean that the only way Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam received wahi was through sama, was through listening to the qiraat of the Qur'an as recited by the angel Jibreel. That definitely did happen. But that's not the only way. When Allah SWT says that he recited the Qur'an on the qalb of Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that means the wahi was sent through Jibreel alayhi salam, yes, Wahi was a recital, recited revelation, kira'a, yes. But Wahi was also sent by Allah SWT onto the qalb of Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So what we learn from that is the Qur'an is meant for the heart. The Qur'an is destined for the heart. The proper space, makan, in fancy English, locus 
for the Quran is the spiritual heart is the Qalb. So what we really have to do generally, but also maybe trying in Ramadan, is to have the Quran enter our heart. And I feel that if we really want Quran al-Karim to be in our heart, it's going to have to be, quote-unquote, from our heart. And that's what I want to talk about today. But let's talk more about this. Qalb, the spiritual heart of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because, you know, the second thing that people sometimes ask, and here I don't think there's been any uh, misrepresentation, it's just a genuine question, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the Qur'an al-Kareem in terms of its recital, its recitation, broken up in different ayat over 20 years in the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So then, what does it mean? Does it mean that Allah ta'ala revealed the Qur'an on the heart of the Prophet ﷺ similarly, gradually? Or was it all revealed at once? And there's no definitive answer to this. And I, I, you know, I cannot say I've been able to look at everything in time for you all today. But this is something that many of the ulama of this year have not really gone into detail to. So it appears, uh, I would say, that the way the language that Allah Ta'ala uses uh, really is suggesting the entire Qur'an. And so maybe we can understand it like this, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has also inscribed the entire Qur'an al-Kareem on the Allah al-Mahfuz, which sometimes in English is just called the eternally preserved tablet. So we know obviously of the existence of the Qur'an al-Kareem inscribed or imprinted in whatever way, and only Allah ta'ala knows best what that is. On Allah al-Mahfuz, and Allah Ta'ala knows best also what that is. But it is a notion of the entire Qur'an al And even more important to that, and even prior to that, some of us may also remember, and again this is a third question, and also this is also a misunderstanding that some people have, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's Qur'an is part of Allah Ta'ala's Kalam, and it means that the divine speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I really don't, you know, that English word speech does nowhere near capture the, you know, depth and feeling of this word kalam, especially given that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-mutakallim. And I don't think we would think that the English word the speaker would be a very, you know, uh, beautiful word to use for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let's just stick to the Arabic. Allah ta'ala is al-mutakallim. Quran al-Kareem is his kalam, and that kalam was not created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That kalam is uncreated, which means, and it's an important thing to understand, and I want everybody to understand this. You don't have to understand it with all the technical detail and the theological debates that took place historically, but you do need to understand that Allah ta'ala is al-mutakallim, right? This is one of Allah ta'ala's sifat, one of the divine attributes one of his asma husna and it means Allah Ta'ala wants us to know him as al-mutakallim. This is something Allah Ta'ala wants us to know about him. This is part of our hidayah, our guidance. So sometimes I know that when we find things that seem to be very technical or very difficult or, you know, disputed, we kind of put it away. No, the proper meaning of this, Allah Ta'ala's al-mutakallim, it means he always has expressed that kalam. That kalam is part of him. The kalam, the Qur'an al-Kareem, the kalam, it is an attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, obviously the paper on which the Qur'an al-Kareem is printed or written or the parchment or the word or the ink that is used, all of that is makhluk, all of that is creation. But what is being written by that paper or printing press, what is being written on that parchment or printed on that paper, that itself, the expression of that, the haqiqah of that, the reality of that, is kalamullah. And that has always existed. Now I want you to think that, and this is beyond our imagination, and that's the real understanding of this, that this is beyond understanding. It is beyond our understanding, our comprehension, our imagination, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has his kalam, Quran al-Kareem, has always existed. It's always been expressed. He's always been al-mutakallim. So if you will, he's always been speaking that kalam. He's always been expressing that kalam. He's always been discoursing that kalam. Whatever more beautiful English word you can use. And all of that pre-eternal, 
attribute of Allah SWT, His Kalam, which is expressed as Mutakallim, is addressed to the Qalb, the heart of Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allahu Akbar Kabira. This is, this is the real incredible aspect. These are the two most incredible things Allah Ta'ala has given to this universe, to the entire created realms. Qur'an Kareem and Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the connection there, the rabt, is that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala pre-eternally, eternally, completely, absolutely expressed His kalam on the qalb of Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Alright? Okay, second meaning of this, that second, so second part, is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants the Qur'an al-Karim to enter all of our hearts, right, because the Prophet sallallahu this is also part of sunnah, that if we are of his ummah and Allah ta'ala placed the Qur'an al-Karim, if you will, inside his heart, so what is the sunnah location for the feelings and meanings of Qur'an in me and you as a member of his ummah, it's our heart, it's our qalb, it's our spiritual heart. So then also now reflect that what is the qalb? So it's not just emotions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, really the qalb is everything. It's not just emotions and feelings. I know sometimes I myself have explained it like that. But it could be one way to explain it. In certain senses, the qalb refers to emotions and feelings. But the Qalb is more than that. The Qalb is like the master control room. It's the totality. Why? Because the Qalb is the core of the Ruh. And the Ruh is in the whole body. And the Ruh is our Asal. Our Asal is not our bodies, our Jism. And you know, when Allah Ta'ala, inshallah, when we get, when we get, when all of us get resurrected, uh, after death, when Allah Ta'ala brings us back to life after death, that may very well be this, our own physical body. But inshallah, when Allah Ta'ala admits us, inshallah, out of His Rahmah into mercy, in, into Jannah, from His Rahmah, Ameen, that will be a new body, right? That's not going to be this physical body, you know, with that mean you have right now. But it will be the same Ruh. It will be the same Ruh. And as all of you know, and we've also said many times, that this Ruh that is inside of us has existed already, for millions and billions and only Allah knows how many years, but not inside this body. So the asal of the asal means the true, essential, important, core, critical, fundamental part of a human being is the ruh, and the asal of the ruh is the qalb. So it means basically that if the Quran is supposed to be in our heart or from our heart, it means every aspect of us, so not just our emotions our thinking, our mentality, our outlook, our personality, our character, our nature, our disposition, our fitra, our akal, our sama, our basa, ev basar, everything. Every single thing. So this is the real, real understanding of Qur'an al And that's why, you know, like, let me give you another example. I remember once many years ago, I don't know, how, maybe not so many years ago, but I probably said this more than once, but I would say that the Qur'an al-Karim is like a love letter sent from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And again, that is true, that is sweet, but it's more than that, because it's not just love. Love is not the only human emotion. Love is not the only aspect of the qalb. No doubt love is maybe one of the strongest, maybe the very strongest aspect of the qalb. And definitely, the more we know Qur'an, so let's even start with that aspect, the more we know Qur'an, the more you will love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if a person thinks that, okay, I don't know Qur'an, but maybe I can learn some poetry or do other things, and that will make me love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Well, yes, you know, there is some, mashallah, good Islamic poetry that will definitely help you and increase your love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but it will never, ever, ever, ever be able to bring that love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your qalb, in your spiritual heart, that only and only can come when the meanings and the feelings of Qur'an al-Kareem themselves are in your heart. Yes, that poem may approximate some of those feelings. That poem may have some symbols of some of those feelings, but it's not asal Qur'an. It's not hakiki Qur'an. It's a knuckle. It's some human being's kalam. It's the poet's words, and they may be wonderful, beautiful, eloquent, amazing, heart-stirring, inspiring, but it's not kalamullah. All right? So even when it comes from, so no doubt, number one, uh, we can talk about this feeling of love, but it's much, much more, right? Uh, 
first of all, it's not even just love, it's also belovedness. Something also that is talked about a lot in the tradition of the soul, but perhaps should be understood, that the mahbubiyya of insan, the two greatest things that makes an insan, makes a human being mahbub, beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is their how much love they have for Qur'an al-Karim in their heart and how much love they have for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam in their heart. These are the two biggest things. Not the how much poetry they can recite or how much other dhikr they can do or any other thing. All of those things will help, but the two, the topmost two things are these two things. But another feeling that the Qur'an is giving, Allah Ta'ala is giving us through the Qur'an is a feeling of belovedness. Right? And that was what really is, is, is captured by this phrase, the Qur'an is a love letter from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah ta'ala wants human beings, He wants them to have hidayah, He wants to shower upon them His rahmah, He wants to send upon them His maghfirah, He wants them to enter into Jannah. So, and all of this is communicated in Qur'an. All of this is communicated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to us in Qur'an al kareem so the Qur'an al-Kareem is like a portal through which Allah Ta'ala communicates with us. He is al-Mutakallam, it's a kalam, and then we have to work that back. That's why I said from the heart, because it comes in the heart, but it's when you mention the second stage that you have the whole cycle, we have to communicate that back. We have to reach out to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala back through the Qur'an al-Kareem, right? And now let me, uh, as I go along, mention this issue of Ramadan. Because if we were, you know, unless somebody is, mashallah, very deep and already very strong in their deen, uh, it's hard for a person to do this with the entire Qur'an in just one month. Yes, a person can recite the Qur'an the Qur'an 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 10 times, etc. in the month of Ramadan. But for a person to say that, no, no, I felt all the feelings of the entire Qur'an, I reflected on all the meanings of the entire Qur'an, I let my heart, heart soak up, all of the Qur'an, I did that in just one month, is very difficult, right? This is what the people have spent, and what me and you are, are, are supposed to spend, our entire lifetime is doing. So that is also partially why uh, those of you who attended last year, uh, and this year, inshallah, if Allah gives us tawfiq to complete it, we only did selected verses, right? Because the purpose of that was not actually to do translation and tafsir of the entire Qur'an, but it was to try to Focus, uh, and every verse has that power, but at least maybe at first glance, at apparent first meaning, uh, those verses and passages that might for us, or people who are weak in Iman, or people who are living in 21st century, however you want to call it, might have the first uh, and foremost impact on our kalb. And when a person has to keep going through that over and over again. So I think that one way really, uh, you know, that to prepare for Ramadan is to spend Rajab and Shaban really trying to reconnect with Qur'an al-Kareem and trying to focus on these things. So let me give you a few pointers that could be done in Rajab and Shaban, could be done any time of the year, I mean, meaning in other words, not specific to Ramadan when mashallah there's the Raviyah and people are reciting more, and there are many extra extra things that go on in Ramadan. So I want to give some pointers for outside Ramadan. Uh, not, there's nothing specific about Rajab and Shaban, but uh, in, in light of the du'a of Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa maybe Rajab and Shaban are a good month for us to uh, improve and prepare our routine, our non-Ramadan routine. So the first thing I would say is that obviously you have to begin with recitation, because for us it's going to go from tongue to the heart. Remember for Rasulullah, he said, Allah, went from Allah Ta'ala to the heart. Quran al-Kareem was sent, wahi, revealed by Allah Ta'ala, entire Quran, direct to the heart of Nabi Kareem, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. For you and me, it's going to go through either tongue or sama, or listening to the heart. And I think that second one is also important, but I'm coming to that in a moment. So it's important to recite every day. You have to recite Quran al-Kareem every day. It's not going to enter the heart, it's not going to come from the heart unless it enters on the tongue and it starts coming from the tongue. That is a reality. You cannot, and this is just, a, for, for people who don't recite or they're too busy to recite or they're too lazy to recite or they find it difficult to recite, so I want to address them. This is a harsh, brutal reality if you want. 
right? Not ground cream, but this fact that you cannot, there's no way around this. There's no series of courses you can take, there's no other books you can read, there's no other zikr you can do, there's no or poetry you can try to, you can do all of that. You have to read and recite Qur'an al You must, it's must. It's first and foremost, it's must, it's fundamental. Alright? Okay. Second, I would stress a lot of sama. You know, uh, you know, those of you who know me, us personally, alhamdulillah, my son is doing hifs, and just because of the barakah of that, Obviously, one gets to hear much more Qur'an than one normally did, you know, and I realize actually that this is, you know, and may Allah bless especially all these Gujarati communities, and I won't take names of people, but mashallah, they listen to so much Qur'an al-Karim in their homes. I mean, on, you know, somebody's recitation, Qari Manshawi, uh, Qari Abdul Basit, whoever they listen to Qari Abdul Basit, may Allah shower his tremendous rahmah on all of the Qur'an of the Ummah, you know, how many, sometimes I think, you know, how many millions have existed that we don't know. This is just modern technology with audio recording and YouTube playing that there are these names. But, you know, this is also a type of kubulia. I'm sure many of you, because I was also very moved by that, that Sudanese uh, recitation, which I actually got a clip, you know, about a year or two before he passed away. May Allah Ta'ala shower his rahmah on him. And may Allah Ta'ala, you know, raise children on deen. And may Allah Ta'ala accept all of the Ummah for Quran. But you really, the, the act of sama really should be increased. And I think that, you know, for some people, when they don't do that all year, that's a big boost in Ramadan for them because they hear the entire Quran and Taraweeh, right? So this should also change. The month of Ramadan should not be the only month when we hear the entire Quran. It should not be, the, the sama should not be, khas, mukhtas, the listening to Quran should not be exclusive to Ramadan. So I think that's another major thing we can do in Rajab and Shaban is start listening to more Qur'an. Now, there's, you know, ways of listening. There's background listening while well, maybe you're doing something in the kitchen. And ulama have said that if there's at least a fair, and you, you have to be the judge of that yourself, as long as there's a fair amount of attention that you are paying to the, Quran, the recitation of Qur'an, uh, even if, let's say, maybe, I don't know, you're cooking or doing something along with that, that's okay. But if you feel, and, and, and so I'll give you a couple of ways to check this. If you feel that you're neglecting it entirely. So for example, you are, I'm just, I'm not, because this is something men and women should both do, and it's not cost to cooking. I'm just giving it as an example. If somebody is cooking in the kitchen, but then, and you have, you're listening to Quran al but then if you find yourself such that you were so busy cooking, and your mind was wandering, and you know, like normally, like if you weren't listening to Quran, your mind would be thinking about random things, right? Like people think about things when they sit on the bus or they cook in the kitchen. If you find that happening also, that means you're not really paying attention to Quran. So you have to fight that. You have to listen. In other words, you have to actively listen. You could be doing something else, you know, mundane activity, but you have to actively be listening to Quran. That's the minimum Quran. So one way to check yourself is, okay, can I, you know, am I making out a few words? Maybe, okay, if you don't know Arabic, but... Allah, Rahman, Jannah, words that you know. Or as like five, ten minutes gone by and you can't even recall a single word, that means you're not listening. Alright? So there is there is a way that you could actively listen to enough of an extent that it is not against adab and you could have Quran in the quote-unquote background while you do something else. Alright? But there's a second type of sama. And that is intently listening exclusively listening, and I would really recommend this. And I think, like, for, as an example, if any of you got that clip of the Sudanese Qari, uh, you know, I can't remember, I think Sheikh Nurain was his name, Rahimullahu Ta'ala, I think all of you would understand what I mean by active, exclusive listening, right? You listened, and you weren't doing anything else. You listened, and you stopped any and everything else that, that you were doing, right? That type of listening. And alhamdulillah, that is obviously the type of listening that would be there inside any salah, uh, the faraid, and also obviously inside salah to tarawih. So we have to have this active listening sama. This should increase. This should be there every day. And you could do this sequentially if you want. Go through the entire Quran, have a playlist or track list or however you do it. Or there may be, you know, you could do it randomly in the sense that, okay, you just pick some clip of one kari. Or you could do it to assist your memorization or reviewing things you've already memorized. 
or you could do it based on meanings or feelings. There's many, many ways this can be done. But the point is sama. So, tilawa, reciting, kira'a, reciting and listening. Reciting and listening. These are both keys to the heart. And I want you to think that really, I mean, obviously we can never hear it from, not in this world, and I'm going to come to some things at the end, inshallah, but we can never hear it uh, from the kiraat of Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But believe me, Sahaba Ikram were hearing it. And they would also hear from another. So a lot of sama, a lot of active, exclusive listening to Quran took place in the lives of the Sahaba. Just like, obviously, a lot of active, exclusive reciting of Quran took place. And we need both. And actually, you know, for many people, sama might even be easier, right? So going back to people who find it difficult to recite for whatever reason, or even they acknowledge that I'm just lazy about it, but I don't know what to do. I know I've been lazy. I keep telling myself not to be lazy. I say, okay, start with sama. You know, and then the more you listen to Quran, the more you will want to recite Quran. So this, let's remember this line. The more you listen to Quran, the more you will want to recite Quran. So that's the biggest answer. You don't have to run around and ask people, oh, I can't recite Quran, what should I do? The more you should listen. So increasing our sama. This is something. When you have that basic ta'alluq with al fadi Quran, that means when you have that basic... Uh, you know, familiarity, manasaba, congeniality, comfort, comfort level, closeness, attachment, hmm? with recitation of Quran and listening to Quran, then you can talk about some things about the heart. All right. So, if there's anybody, for example, who recites Surah Kahf every Friday, you would understand what I'm saying. What? Because if you recite every Friday, you you become familiar. You may not become a hafiz of it. But you're pretty much like a hafiz in the sense that you can't recite it with, with you know, with the must have closed, but you almost know like every time what the next word and what the next line is, right? That's a level of familiarity. That's that look. You that that's called that look with the alfaz of the Quran. So what a person has with Surah Al Fatiha, what people who recite Surah Kaf on Fridays have with that. What if somebody recites Surah Yasin or Surah Mulk or any other, you know, uh, something regularly? So that's an example for you, for your own lives, how much regular recitation or regular listening. You know, if if I ever have to listen to a particular sabak of my sons a number of times, and, and you know, we have obviously the Akaris who teach him, so I don't do that that much, but the you know, whenever I had to do that more when he was in between Akaris, I can still remember. Or if I come across that passage in Quran, I can easily remember, oh, that was the, the page that I did with Wachi, right? So the act of listening to something repeatedly also gives you a deeper taluk. So you have to have that connection with Quran. All right. Then from the heart. So I'd mentioned that from the heart, it's hard in one month or in one go or one systematic process to get the heart connection with all of Quran. So here you have to select now. And this is then okay for somebody who doesn't know Arabic and they have to look at some uh, translation, always understanding that the translation is not Kalam Allah, the translation is Kalam al Insan, the translation is imperfect, is inadequate, is flawed, but uh, it's still uh, the better translations, inshallah, uh, will still give you a very, very, very close rendering of the meanings uh, of Quran al Karim. And so you have to find verses that strike you. So this this is now a second type of reading. So I'm not going to call kira'a um, unless you understand Arabic. So you will actually be reading a translation in this case, right? Whether it's Urdu was Arabic or better yet, listening to Adar. So now there's so many people who have done so many dhus on the internet. And you should listen to more than one person, by the way. Uh, you should never listen to only just one. Maybe I wouldn't say listen to everyone. Uh, and I wouldn't say listen to no one. And I wouldn't say listen to only one. So listen to a few ones, all right? Uh, two to three is a good number to start with, right? Uh, just because, you know, the slightly different way they may have of explaining will stimulate your mind to think now. It won't be passive. You'll have to think. You will automatically, your mind, uh, and it's nothing about being highly educated or highly intelligent. This is a natural thing. If you hear two or three people explain, let's say even Surah Al-Fatiha, your mind will naturally get into gear. And that's an important thing, Right? Because the mind and heart, the akal and kalb are related. We explained this in Urdu Bayan a couple of months ago. 
Inshallah, I will do it in English at some point as well. The aql and qalb, the mind and the heart, are intricately related in Islam. They're not two separate things, that one is your rational not-self and one is your emotional self. They're exact, and they're, it's all interrelated. And so anyway, so when you're, whether you're reading the translation or better yet, you're listening to a series and reading the translation along with it, just so that you have that guidance of the ulama, scholars, experts, lecturers, somebody who's more knowledgeable than you, then there will be some verses that strike you first or strike you more. Strike you means they strike a chord in your heart, as they say. It means they impact your heart. They stir a feeling. Maybe you feel the feeling of fear of Allah Ta'ala. Maybe you feel the fear of death. Maybe you feel a longing for death. Maybe you feel a longing for Akhara. Maybe you feel a fear for hell. Maybe you feel humility in front of Allah Ta'ala. Maybe you feel shame over your sins. Anything, any explanation, translation, commentary, anything that affects your heart. And inshallah, by the way, as you increase your reciting and listening of the Arabic, even Arabic will, will affect your heart, inshallah. Okay? Whenever that happens, you should maybe mark that or make a note of that, right? And that is the first now that you need to cling to, you need to return to, you need to go deeper into. You may not be able to do it for everything in the Quran al Karim. Maybe there may be some legal aspects, or ahkam, certain laws, maybe about inheritance or divorce that may not instantly do this for you. There may be certain stories or maybe that you can't even understand properly without the fear sometimes if you just have a th translation. You have to find things. And so that's what we tried to do. And if you remember that series, actually, I didn't, wasn't doing it entirely myself. Imam al Ghazai, Rumullah Ta'ala, has written a work called Jawahir al Quran where he has identified what he calls the jewels of the Qur'an, what he calls the gems of the Qur'an, and sort of we go through all of that in that series, right? And so then, either way, however you do it, it's a selection, right? And I would say, again, you should start that process now. Why? Because you want to continue it after Ramadan. And I think all of us have realized this, that those things that we only start on one Ramadan, we pretty much stop doing at 30 Ramadan. So if we really, really want that something should change in our lives this year in Ramadan, you're going to have to start doing it before Ramadan. I think that if somebody starts doing something on one Rajab and manages to do it, you know, on and off, maybe not every day, but manages to do it a fair amount in Rajab and Shaban, inshallah, then inshallah they will do it wonderfully and wondrously in Ramadan, and inshallah they'll keep doing it after the month of Ramadan. All right. Another major aspect of Qur'an from the heart is the du'as. And there are many, many collections of this. You can find in Arabic, English, Urdu, many, many collections of the du'as from the Qur'an al-Karim. So once I had explained to some friends to take uh, the work of Shaykh Ashraf Ali Tanvir Mulatala, which does include a fair number of du'as from the Qur'an, but many, many from Hadith, and to read it through once, the translation, if you... Uh, the Urdu or English translation, however it may be, and circle those du'as that impact you first, or the most, or however you want to call it. Same thing for the if you get a book of a collection of all the du'as in the Qur'an, right? And then these du'as obviously should be made as du'a, right? So not just qiraat or translation of tafsir, but we should offer them as du'a to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Offer them a dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another aspect of dua related to Qur'an is whenever you listen to Qur'an, sama, whenever you recite Qur'an, at the end of that, make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And try that, and you can make dua for anything at that time, but try that some of your duas, if possible, if you understood in any level what you recited or what you heard, part of your dua should pertain to that. Maybe even just to impact. So let's say you listened uh, and I'm going to keep mentioning him but, uh, because it is a very moving recitation. So let's say you listen to Sheikh Nguyen's recitation and let's say you don't know any Arabic at all. Okay. But still, something happened to you in that act of listening. You got a feeling. So you can make dua to Allah Ta'ala, Ya Allah, the same way that listening to this particular recitation at this particular moment impacted my heart. Ya Allah, let me, my heart always be moved by Quran. Let my heart always be impacted by Quran. Let my heart always feel Quran. In other words, your du'as after your listening to or reciting of Quran should always have an element about you in the Quran, about Allah Ta'ala in the Quran and you, right? In some way or the other. So, 
if you see a lot of what I'm talking about is not really treating the Quran al-Kareem as a kitab, although in Ramadan we will do that in that sense that, we, you know, inshallah people try to recite it entirely, listen it to it in tarafi entirely. What I'm sort of suggesting to you today is a more, let's say, scattered approach. And that may, may work for some of you, for some of you may not work, but I was just wa wanting to share with it, uh, share it with you today. Because it's not always easy for everyone to go start to finish. Uh, but that is the goal, that is the aim, right? That itself is a very, very beneficial thing. But I think that's unlikely to happen in Rajab and Shaban for most people. But definitely, if we try to increase our connection and contact with Qur'an, in these two months and in Ramadan, in Ramadan, inshallah, you can go through cover to cover many times in many ways. Your own recitation, listening to the Ruri, maybe some translation, maybe even tafsir, uh, and, and you'll have the thirst and the desire to do that, right? You'll have the thirst and desire to do that if you build that up in these months of Rajab and Sha'ban. All right, when you're reading and reciting Qur'an al -Karim, you know, sometimes, let's say, you know, sometimes a person says, that, you know, I just can't feel anything. Even I read the translation along with it, or I was reading a Musaf that had, you know, Qur'an al -Karim, the Arabic, true, only Qur'an, and some translation underneath, and I was reading it somehow and together in tandem. It still didn't affect me. Okay. So if this happens to you, sometimes you should pause and just think, okay, maybe maybe there's too much going on in your day that day. Maybe your mind is too cluttered. Your heart is too distressed. For some reason, which you are, alhamdulillah, openly acknowledging and alhamdulillah, you're identifying and tracking this, you cannot feel anything. All right. So at that moment, what you should do is you should just pause and just feel this, that this mushaf in my hand, this kalam that I'm reading, is from Allah. So don't try to feel any feeling related to the particular meaning of that verse. That's what I'm saying. Just feel the general awe of the fact that I'm reciting Kalamullah to Allah Ta'ala. That's it. That itself is a very important feeling. That I'm reciting Kalamullah to Allah Ta'ala. Allah Ta'ala as Samir, He's all listening. Al Basir, all seeing. Al Khabir, all aware. Al Alim, all knowing. He knows and is aware and is seeing me recite and hearing me recite. That, inshallah, should be enough to get a feeling. And that itself will produce a very good feeling. Because that is the feeling of dhikr of Allah Ta'ala. That is the feeling of shu'ur. That is the feeling of uh, a remembrance of Allah Ta'ala, of awareness of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. That's actually a very important and very powerful feeling. That's the feeling you can get even on Alif Lam Mim, right? There's no translation uh, for that. There's no tafsir. I mean, there's obviously people have written many tafsir, but there's no definitive tafsir for that. Uh, there's no quote-unquote meaning that you get the feeling, right? But, and then sometimes think also, uh, you know, I, I, that may be something to do at some point, inshallah, as well. Think about the concept of wahi, right? Think about this, that this, what I'm reciting so easily, that I just picked up a printed mushaf, this was Allah Ta'ala's kalam forever. Allah Ta'ala sent this on Lawul Mafuz, He sent it on the Kalb of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He sent Angel Jibreel Alayhi Salaam, Jibreel Alayhi Salaam recited it, the Prophet recited it to Sahaba. Just think of the whole history of Revelation. How, you know, this Musaf that's in front of you, there's the whole history, it didn't just come there, right? It's come, you know, there's a 1400 years history, and like I told you, there's parts of that history that go back to all of pre-eternity, right? That's also something to feel. That this is an enormous thing. This is a, it's the most deep and profound thing any human being can do. Really, is recite Quran al Karim. So that can also uh, give you a kind of feeling. The third thing is, and there are some books I'm trying to remember. You know, there was this. Uh, there is still a book by a person by the name of Ahmed von Denfer. I think it's the most basic elementary book on Ulum al Quran. And I remember when I read that many many years ago. Uh, that was the first time I saw a presentation where you gather all the ways that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself has referred to Qur'an, right? So the Qur'an is Azim, it's Kareem, it's Furqan, right? It's Noor, etc., etc. So think about it's Mubin. So think about all these things. Sometimes you just do that as well. Just think this is the, that's why I'm reciting. I'm reciting because I need that Mubin. I need that clarity in my life, in my heart. 
I'm reciting because this book is Furqan. It's going to, so Furqan means it's going to be the distinguishing criteria for what's right and what's wrong. So just recite, then you're just reciting. Maybe you don't, then just even put away the translation. Just recite the Arabic and you don't, but your niya, right? Your niya, your intention, your talab is for rust and hidayah. It's for guidance from Allah subhanahu wa You want the nur of Quran. You want the tibyan, the bayan of Quran. You want the Furqan of Quran. So that's another thing. So I gave you the reference of, it's a very, I, I'm pretty sure you can find that book very easily. He gives you all the different words that Allah Ta'ala himself has used. Sometimes also, but I would say this very um, cautiously so you don't overdo it, but it's there, so I will say it. You can also have that hissi, uh, which means a material sensory connection with Quran. So you hold it, Right? Because it is a kitab in that sense as well, in the way the mushaf is printed and the way you're holding it. Uh, and you should feel a love for the physical mushaf of Quran that you have. You should love its binding, you should love its cover, you should love its pages, and all of that is not even the Quran, right? You should love the ink with which Quran cream is printed, you should love the lettering, the calligraphy, the style, the border. And so sometimes even that can also be uh, a way. Uh, we should not be overdone because we're not people of sort of materialistic, ritualistic. There are uh, sensory aspects to our deen, but alhamdulillah, Allah Ta'ala, uh, because Islam has been designed by Allah SWT as a perfect deen, it has itadal, has balance. It's not overly uh, materialistic and ritualistic, but it's not overly abstract either. Uh, so there's an element uh, of this as well. Um, and, so, and so if you're not able to feel anything, just pause, just, I don't know, Roll your hand or your fingers, stroke, if you will, right? Uh, the pages of Quran or just let your eyes just roam over the ink of Quran. Okay, this is something you can personally uh, find your own way to do, right? Another way, so it, it, to go back, uh, something I had said to you about the Quran, uh, let's say you're reciting, I mean, let's say you're just somewhere, anywhere, you're reciting Surah Safat, anywhere you're in your station and you say, I'm not feeling anything, I can't. I can't focus. I could go back all the way to the beginning and just read this. Zalik al kitabu la reiba fi hudalil muttaqin. Just go back. It's an easy place to go back to. That's why I'm picking this. But it's also the way Allah Ta'ala began, so to speak, in terms of the way Allah Ta'ala uh, guided Sayyidina Rasulullah Wasallam to arrange the Quran. This is the beginning, right? I mean, after Surah Fatah, it's the beginning of Surah Baqarah, right? So go back and just recite that. Look at that. Zalik al kitabu la reiba fi. Just Recite that a few times. Think about that a few times. Ponder over that a few times. And then go back. Let, let's say, for example, you were in Safa. Go back to wherever you were reciting. Sometimes that can do something for you. Uh, sometimes, you know, also some people have mentioned that if you uh, make a fresh wudu, so maybe what happened was that you had made wudu and you had prayed Zohar with that wudu and maybe Masha, you had made Asr with that wudu and now you're reciting Quran as well. Uh, so yes, you had wudu, and that was perfectly fine. But maybe sometimes it can also help that you make a fresh wudu specifically for this reason. Uh, and so it's, a, it's called a nafil. It's kind of a mustab. It's a extra. Uh, it's not required. It's not fard because you have wudu. But if you want to make any extra ibadah after already having made one ibadah with your wudu, then sometimes you can make an extra wudu on top of your existing one. All right, I hope that was clear. Um, this is also something that may help. So if you go and make wudu and then come back, inshallah, that may also just, uh, and that and has that power. I mean, this should be a whole separate talk, I guess, but Allah Ta'ala has given wudu an incredible power. And again, that's why I said we can't just focus on the material aspect of it, oh, that is water, what is it I'm putting water on. It, it, there's much more to it. There's much more going on during the act of wudu. Uh, let's say unseen, right? Again, not to get overly mystical, but there's much more going on than just putting water, right? Uh, and you'll see that, inshallah, if you try this in, in recitation of Quran, that you go make wudu and then come back and then see if you still feel that way that oh, I can't concentrate and I'm not feeling anything, etc., etc. All right. Uh, and you know, another thing I would tell you about this, it, it's just sort of the last. So the last thing about this part is, if none of this works for you, keep reciting. I, I really want to stress this, it's very important. 
It should not be the case. Do not ever let yourself become like this. And it's very easy to become like this. Do not let yourself become like this. Like what? That, oh, well, whenever I stop feeling, I stop reciting. No. Whenever I stop focusing, I stop reciting. No. Don't think like that. No, no, see, I had to stop reciting because I wasn't focusing, I wasn't feeling, my mind was wandering. Okay, I would say at least this much. Don't stop immediately. Push on a little bit, a few more minutes, because that is submission. That is humility. That is uds. That is obedience. So don't have this mentality of oh, I was reciting Quran, and then as soon as I got as soon as I got tired, I stopped. As soon as my mind wandered, I stopped. As soon as I got distracted, I stopped. As soon as I couldn't feel anything, I stopped. No, because then again, you're going to fall into that error of that you were doing it for the feelings. No, 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 no. So sometimes it's good. Not even good, I would say great. Very beneficial. To keep reciting even though you feel nothing. You say, I have no feeling. I say, keep reciting. But I'm not focusing. Keep reciting. Why? Because Allah is Allah and I'm his abd. And I'm his, he's my master. I'm his slave. So now I'm reciting. Why? Not for the heart, from the heart, none of that feel-good stuff. I'm reciting out of slavery. I'm reciting out of subordination, submission, subjugation, slavery, ubudiyya. Hmm? And that itself, and don't, don't think this is the lowest form of recitation. This is the high, high form of recitation. High form of recitation. To keep reciting, keep reciting. All right? So we don't we sound like we're only reciting for meanings and feelings and epiphanies and all what struck my heart. I, I, what I'm saying right now is the ittada, the balance to the whole rest of the talk. I repeat again, we're not only reciting or not trying to always recite for meanings and feelings and connections and heart. And, no, no, not always, not only. Also, many very high form recitation, pure ubudiyya. Somebody has to go, oh, why are you reciting you don't understand? I'm a slave. Why are you reciting you say you don't feel anything? I'm a slave. Why are you reciting if you don't even know the history of Wahi? I'm a slave. Why are you reciting you don't know the Sabah Oh, anything they can ask you. Anything. Anything they can ask you. I'm his slave. He is my master. This is his kalam. That's it. That's the answer. Don't let any ideology trick you, delude you. Oh, what's the point of... I can't, how can you even ask this question? In other words, let me explain to you point blank. Recitation of Quran can never be pointless. So nobody can, nobody should even dare to ask this question. What's the point of reciting if you don't know this? Oh, oh, okay. Somebody said, what's the point of reciting if you didn't wake up for Fajr? What's the point of reciting if you still work in a bank? What's the point of reciting if you're still doing this sin? The point is I'm his slave and he's my master and this is his kalam. That's it. You don't need to answer anything to anybody. There's another big misconception, right? That some, you know, some secular liberals like to mock and tease Muslims. And unfortunately, some Orthodox conservative Muslims also like to tease struggling Muslims. You know, what's the point of them reciting a day? La Hawla, who are you to come between that, that person and Allah Ta'ala? Did Allah Ta'ala make you the watchman of who's allowed and who's not allowed to recite Quran? I'm telling you, for anything, I don't care what the person is doing, if they're sitting and reciting, you are not going to ask them this question. What's the point of reciting? You say, oh, I saw him come out of a haram movie, and he's, look at him now, he's trying to recite. He's, if Allah is his master, he is his slave, he wants to recite, he will recite. You know, and you, if Allah Ta'ala, if you try to think that you can stop people from reciting Quran, or you can decide who's worthy of reciting and who's not, and, and that what it means is you think that you are worthy to recite, and he is not, or you are worthy to recite, and she is not, hmm? What's the point? But why does she recite? She doesn't wear hijab. La hawla wa la quwwata billah. Hmm? So also all this false, fake, ultra-orthodox conservatism, judging people, and trying to judge who is worthy and not worthy to recite Quran. La hawla wa la quwwata billah. This is a major delusion, major deception. You should, if you are true and sincere, if you're supposedly an orthodox conservative Muslim, and I don't like those terms, I mean, these are terms that are used for, you know, in Jewish and Christian communities have divided themselves into orthodox, conservative, liberal, modern, and this should never happen to Muslims, right? There's just Muslim, we're just one and only Muslim. And yes, that's pretty orthodox and conservative, by the way, but we don't want to make that a separate category, right? You should be overjoyed that that person is reciting Quran. 
you should fall into sajda. If you know that there's somebody who you know to be a sinner and you see them reciting the Quran, you should fall into sajda to shukr to Allah Ta'ala. You should cry to Allah Ta'ala, Ya Allah, you gave this person hidayah to recite Quran, even though they did some sin against you. Ya Allah, you're so rahim, you're so al-hadi, you're so merciful, you're so all-guiding. Okay, so, so what, I, what I wanted to mention to you was that even if we don't feel anything, even if we don't feel any connection, we should keep reciting out of Ubudiyah that Allah Ta'ala is our master and we are his slave. Alright? Okay, I have at other times, and so I can't repeat all of that here. I don't know where, if that stuff is uploaded or not, but I have sometimes given entire lectures specifically on you know, ways of understanding Qur'an, ways of reading Qur'an, breaking, you know, trying to understand the themes of a surah, trying to, you know, reflect on what Allah Ta'ala is trying to remind you of, why is this passage here, why in Surah Kaf did Allah Ta'ala put the story of Ashab al Kaf and the story of Musa al <coughs> and Khizr and the story of Zulkarnayn, etc., etc., and other stories all there together. So these are also aspects. Uh, I won't talk about that today, but this is something then you would really have to attend some type of lecture series on the Qur'an, and that is important also. And that will many times help a person uh, in feeling that uh, heartfelt recitation of Qur'an. By the way, you know, I, I also wanted to say, you know, when I when I was talking to you about the materiality, uh, just pause and, you know, look at the ink and, you know, love the calligraphy. This is also true for summer, right? And it's also true for some of you listening. I mean, not if you're listening in that way that you're, you know, doing some work and you're totally not even listening, you're, you're not even hearing the Quran. But listen, and it's okay if, let's say, you put your headphones on, you're listening to um, any, any Qari of Quran. It's okay. At that point, if your mind wanders, it's okay because you're not doing anything else actively. Keep listening, right? And sometimes here again, I would say, you know, try to tune in to the sound because this is also a power of Quran al Karim. It's salt, uh, it's it's tenor, the, the qalqala, the, the 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 long vowels, the mud. All of this is experienced, right? All of this should be experienced. So sometimes when you're listening intently, it, it doesn't always have to be that you're listening intently for the meaning and the feeling and all of that. You can also Listen intently to try to experience and hear the sound, you know. Uh, this is another aspect of Qur'an. And again, something I won't talk about today, but increasing your memorization of Qur'an or reviewing what you've already memorized or trying to use that more in prayer, in salah, or memorizing a little bit more so that you have something, quote-unquote, new, new for you, new in your memory bank to recite in Qur'an, so that there is some uh, to recite in salah, so that your sound doesn't become too recognized. But these things are also helpful. Uh, and this is something that a person should work on. And, and it's very good if you do this with those verses or passages that you do understand the meaning of or do uh, inspire your heart to feel feelings for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Basically, what you want to be tracking then after this, and let me now conclude with a couple of last things. Uh, let me say one, two things. The first is that you want to track some change in your life and heart, in your behavior, in your character, and your worship. Somewhere, there should be some change that comes from your recitation and listening and pondering and reflecting on Quran. And if that doesn't happen, this is something you have to make dua for. So, for example, when you stop, when you when you complete, uh, you know, whatever you're reciting for that day, or listening to for that day, or studying, or reading, or translating for that day, make dua to Allah Ta'ala. That, Ya Allah, let whatever I recited, or heard, or understood today, and let the entire could change me. Let it change the, my relationship with you. I mean, improve, right? Let it change my salah. Let it change my relationships with others. Let it change my behavior. Let it change my character. That changed my personality. This is a major dua to make, also, right? That we, remember, the qalb is everything about us. So we have to, when we're making this dua, you have to flush it out. It's not just maybe enough to say, "Yalla, make the Quran enter my qalb," 
let me recite Quran from the Qalam, let me feel Quran from the Qalam. But sometimes you may want to flush out, Ya Allah, I want the Quran al Kareem, I want all, every single thing you put in the Quran. The nur of the Quran, the hakika of the Quran, the ma'ani of the Quran, the south of the Quran, everything to enter every and affect every part of me. My heart, my character, my behavior, my comportment, my disposition, my personality, my feelings, my thoughts, my words, etc. Right? And now the last thing I will say is that Alhamdulillah, inshallah, you know, inshallah, if if we try our best and make Toba to Allah Ta'ala and obviously Allah Subhanahu Ta'ala sends his rahmah on us on the day of judgment and inshallah we make it to Jannah, then there's a whole other experience of Quran. And I want you to understand that. Because generally we have to understand that me and you and all of us we were not created for this world, right? We were not created in this world. Allah Ta'ala did not create our ruh on planet Earth. Only our body was created on planet Earth. Okay? Our ruh was created in the law. And only Allah knows best what that makan, what that spatial dimension was. But it's called in the law, means if you were in the presence of Allah Ta'ala, by Allah Subhanahu Ta'ala, kun fa yakun. Alright? Where we end up, inshallah, inshallah, may Allah Ta'ala send us rahmat as Allah min jannah min al-nar. May Allah Ta'ala protect us and save us and grant us salvation from the fire of hell which we have undoubtedly earned and deserved due to our misdeeds. And may Allah Ta'ala grant us jannah due to His limitless, endless, boundless rahmat and mercy. But inshallah, if we make it to jannah, either way, you know, we are made for the akhirah. Let's put it that way. Right? And inshallah we hope that we are made for Jannah. So what exactly happens in Jannah? Now I want you to think. Right? I want you to think of Jannah in a new way now, today. It's not the only way. It's an additional way. Maybe a new way for some of you. Maybe maybe not so many of you have already thought about it like this. So see, me, I'm not a Hafiz. Right? And you know, when you try to become a parent of a Hafiz, it really it, it changes many things. It changes your understanding of many things. So... I make dua al Ta'ala make me Hafiz in Jannah, then I was thinking about this. It was very recently, right? I was thinking, I probably Allah Ta'ala will make everybody a Hafiz in Jannah. And I started thinking, how come I've never heard this? I've never read this anywhere. And then I thought about this, and, you know, again, I, I didn't have the time to research this. I'm sure Ulama must have mentioned this, but I'll mention it tonight. Allah Ta'ala accepts these words. But inshallah, Allah Ta'ala will make every one of us a Hafiz of Quran in Jannah, right? So, I mean, if nothing else, right, we know for sure that you get anything that you want in Jannah. So I'm sure every mu'min would want this. So I think I can say 99.999% inshallah that every mu'min will be a hafiz of Qur'an, hafiz of Qur'an in Jannah. So that's what our destiny is, right? Okay, now, okay, it's not just that. What are we going to be doing in Jannah? We, you think maybe, you know, some fasting will stop, right? Uh, I don't think recitation of Quran will stop. So, and not just that, but hearing. So remember we talked about sama. So getting to hear kalamullah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This itself is enough of a concept of Jannah. Let's say I told you, and that's not the case. There's many, many more things to Jannah. But let's say I told you that how about this? If you obey Allah ta'ala, you submit to Allah ta'ala, you follow His commands, you stay away from sin. If you do sin, you repent from sin. And even then, we'll still be worthy of going to Jahannam, but maybe then Allah Ta'ala, out of His Rahmah on the Day of Judgment, puts us in Jannah. And you ask me, okay, what is Jannah? And I say, Jannah is simply this, that you will become a Hafiz of the Qur'an, and forever you will either be reciting Qur'an to Allah Ta'ala, or Allah Ta'ala will recite Qur'an to you. Let's say that's it. Let's just pretend that's all that Jannah was. You will say, Allah, that would be enough. That be enough, right? That would be more than enough. We will say, Ya Allah, this, this is incredible. Mercy from you, especially those of us who are not Ufaz, but even those who are Ufaz, I think, would feel this way, right? And that's, everything I said is true, except that this is not the only part of Jannah. There's much, much more to Jannah that Allah Ta'ala Himself in Qur'an al-Kareem and Allah Ta'ala through Nabi al-Kareem, sallallahu has told us. And there's also, by the way, much about Jannah that Allah Ta'ala has not shared with us. And wonders and delights, He's just given Isha'at, wonders and delights, the kind of which that no I has ever behold, beheld and no one can ever imagine, right? So Allah alam, what that is. But one thing that we can't imagine, this is what I maybe I'm saying to you, that there's so many unimaginable things, yes, and that's also amazing. 
But I'm telling you, even the things that mean you can imagine, that's also incredibly amazing. This is purely imaginable. I mean you can imagine because some that we have seen and met and heard of us, right? So we can imagine what it would be like to be a Hafiz. We have recited Quran ourselves. We've heard recitation. So we can imagine what it's like to recite continuously. Yeah, we can't imagine what it would be like to hear Allah Ta'ala recite in Quran, but mashallah, we have heard these great Quran recite Quran, and we can imagine at least what it's like to hear Quran recited in a much more beautiful way than we can recite it. So this is imaginable, right? And sometimes we should think about that. Think about that when you're reading Quran, that, Ya Allah, okay, I'm not doing it so well now, but Ya Allah, in Jannah, inshallah. In Jannah, inshallah, I'll recite long Quran to you. I will hear long recitation from you. I will get all the feelings and all the meanings. And, you know, that's an also, I think, by the way. Let me go further. In Jannah, okay, let me try to, let, let me go further and just share everything with you. In Jannah, inshallah, I mean, Allahu Alam, but inshallah, not only will we all be hafiz, we'll all be saba ashar akari. You'll know everything. Inshallah, you'll be a big mufassir of Quran. You'll know more to see than all the Mufassir and alive combined knew. Hmm? Allah Akbar, can you imagine just what life would be like that? If you were a Hafiz of the Quran, Masha, there are few blessed individuals in this Ummah who actually have that in this world, that they're Hafiz of Quran, they're Sabah Asher Akari, they're Mufassir of Quran, right? Now, but imagine, okay, fine, we couldn't do that in this world, but in Jannah, inshallah. Like, what type of life would that be, right? And then, now, Allah Ta'ala, yes, inshallah, Allah Ta'ala is reciting Qur'an Jannah. Imagine if Allah Ta'ala does the fear of Qur'an forever for all of your journey. It's like Allah Ta'ala just keeps sharing with us more and more meanings. And remember this, that the meanings of the Qur'an are limitless. Remember even in one, it comes in two places of Qur'an, but in a single verse Allah Ta'ala said that if all, right, all of the oceans were ink, all of the whatever reed pens were, all the trees were turned into pens, they could not write even, right? What? Not, not the tafsir of Qur'an. They couldn't even write the praises of Allah Ta'ala or the bounties and blessings of Allah Subhanahu Ta'ala. Hmm? So then imagine that, this is an aspect of Jannah, that Allah Ta'ala will keep sharing with us, keep, in a sense, I may be using with tafsir is not appropriate, but Allah Ta'ala will keep Unveiling to us deeper and deeper meanings and feelings of Quran. So what does all this mean then? Because we can imagine that to a sense, if anybody studied tafsir, one could imagine what it would be like to know how much tafsir that Imam Ar-Razi, Imam At-Tabri knew. A person can just imagine that, right? So what does that mean? That means this is what mean you are for. This is what we exist for. Because this is, everything else we do in this world is of this world. It's going to end in this world, right? These things aren't going to be happening in Jannah, inshallah. Right? So, what is our reality, our hakika, our reality as makhluk, as ruh, as insan, is those things that are going to keep happening and doing happening in akhirah, in jannah, inshallah. And the biggest reality of that is Quran. Alright? So, this is uh, what we wanted to share. We make dua that Allah Ta'ala accept it from us. We make dua that Allah Ta'ala take all of us out of our slumber, our laziness, our neglect, our ghafla, and that we have been for so long in so many ways, ghafil an al-Qur'an, ghafil an Allah, we've been heedless of, negligent of, neglectful of Qur'an al-Kareem, of al-Mutakallim, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. Let me ask Allah ta'ala to make us you know, open our eyes and our hearts to the reality of things, and may Allah Ta'ala just protect us in this world, and may Allah Ta'ala make the dunya just a place where we, where, where our iman survives, and may Allah Ta'ala grant us all the blessings and barakat of Jannat wa akhir da'wana, and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Make dua subhanallah wa alhamdulillah wa la ilaha illallah wa allahu akbar, subhanallah wa bihamdi subhanallah al-adheem. اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد ربنا ظلمنا أنفسنا وإن لم تغفر لنا وترحمنا لنكونن من الخاسرين رب اغفر وارحم وانت خير الراحمين ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد اذ هديتنا وحبلنا من لدنك الرحمه 
انك انت الوهاب ربنا اتنا في الدنيا حسنه وفي الاخره حسنه وقنا عذاب النار يا الله رب كريم يا سيد يو فورغيف اس يا الله forgive us for all the sins that we ever did forgive us especially for the sins that we did even though you sent upon us Quran that you gave us this Furqan that you gave us this Quran in Mubin Yalla, still Ya Rab we remained in doubt we remained in uncertainty we remained in hesitation we became distant from Deen Yalla, we ask that you send your Hidayah on our hearts Hidayah on our Ruh bring us back upon Deen make us strong on Deen make us steadfast on Deen make us firm in our Deen put on our hearts, Ya Rabbi, a passion for deen, a thirst for deen, make us active in deen, make us dynamic on deen. Ya Rabbi Kareem, we ask that you grant us only and only the khair of this dunya, protect us from anything in this dunya that could take us away from you, that could even distract us from you, that could divert us from Surat Al-Mustaqeem. Ya Rabbi Kareem, again, grant us this dunya in measure and grant us akhirah without hisab. Ya Rabbi Kareem, grant us the barakat of dunya, the hasanat of dunya, and Ya Rabbi, save us from the sayat of the dunya, the sayat of our nafs, the wasawas of shaitan. Ya Rabbi Kareem, keep us in your hifaz. Keep us in aman, keep us under the shade of your rahma. Send upon us always your makfira. Ya Rabbi Kareem, increase us in our recitation of Quran. Let our tongues always be moist with your kalam, Ya Rabbi Kareem. Ya Rabbi, increase us in the sama of Quran. Let our ears always be blessed and adorned with the sounds of kiraat. The beautiful sound of Qirat, Ya Rabbi Kareem. Ya Allah, inspire our minds with the true understanding and meanings of Qur'an. Protect us, Ya Rabbi, from the smallest of mistakes and protect us, Ya Rabbi, from the false ideologies. Ya Rabbi, make us understand Qur'an Kareem through the true translation and tafsir and increase us in our language of Arabic, Ya Rabbi, so we can understand Qur'an and Arabiya, Ya Rabbi Kareem. And Ya Allah, we ask that you fill our heart and our ruh and our character, and our personality, and our mind, and our feelings, and our thoughts, all with Qur'an, fully with Qur'an. Let the Qur'an overpower us, let it overwhelm us, let it revive us, let it inspire us, let it motivate us, let it begin to make it easy for us. And ya Allah, accept anything that was said of khair in this talk, make it means for us to do amal, grant us from your hidayah many, many more and better ways to do amal, grant us every and all right and correct approaches to Qur'an and protect us, Ya Rabbi Kareem, from any and all mistakes and misunderstandings of Qur'an. Ya Rabbi Kareem, we ask that you put in our heart a love for Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Sahib Qur'an, Tari Qur'an, Nashir Qur'an. Put in our heart a love for every aspect of his sunnah. Let us be guided by the nur of that sunnah. Ya Rabbi Kareem, put our love in our heart for his sahaba. Put our heart in our love for heart for his seerah, Ya Rabbi Kareem, increase us in our ilm, increase us in our knowledge of deen, knowledge of Qur'an, knowledge of seerah, knowledge of sunnah, increase us in our amal and our practice upon these things, protect us, Ya Rabbi, from every evil, Ya Rabbi, protect us from the evil inside of ourselves, protect us from the evil in others, protect us from the evil of shaitan, protect us from the evils of this world, Ya let us always and only and ever be a source of good for other people, forget us, Ya Rabbi, if ever we have hurt anyone, and forgive, Ya Rabbi, those those who have hurt us. Ya Rabbi, put peace and love and harmony between the hearts of the Ummah. Ya Allah, we ask you to make the Ummah strong again. Protect the Ummah, Ya Rabbi Kareem. Make us an Ummah of the Quran and Sunnah. Make us an Ummah, Ya Rabbi, of Afwan, Adil, and Ihsan. Ya Rabbi Kareem, we ask that you rescue the Ummah from all of the injustices in this world, all of the oppressions in this world. We ask that you bring forth again from this Ummah that true force of power, Ya Rabbi, who will fight the oppressors and fight those who are unjust and rescue the oppressed, Ya Rabbi Kareem. We make special dua for the mu'mineen and mu'minat in China, Ya Rabb. For the Uyghurs of Xinjiang, the, all of the Muslims who are being oppressed, Ya Rabbi Kareem. Shower your hifaz upon them. Ya Allah, you are the being of all power. You are al-qawiyul mateen. You are the intiqam. Ya Allah, we ask that you shower your might and power on the zalimeen. Do rad of their zulm, Ya Rabbi Kareem. Ya Allah, we ask that you make us strong, Ya Rabb. Let us have compassion. Let us have feeling. Let us help in every and any way that we can. Let us be, Ya Rabb, friends of one another, friends of the Ummah, friends of the poor, friends of the oppressed, friends of the weak, 
friends of the needy, Ya Allah, grant us this sunnah of the Anbiya, Layim as Salaam Ajma'in, Ya Allah, take us away from our materialistic pursuits, Ya Allah, let us not be distracted by our materialistic comforts, let us not be distracted by the false things in this world, Ya Rabbi Kareem, make us true mu'mineen, make us from your ibad as-salihin, min ibadik as-salihin, from your true and righteous and virtuous slaves, Ya Rabbi, make us from the muttaqeen, make us from the zakirin, make us from the mutawakkirin, Ya Rabbi Kareem, grant us barakah and rajab and shaban, make, let us reach the month of Ramadan, and grant us tremendous blessings in the month of Ramadan, let it be a life-changing period of our life, let us finally, Ya Rabbi, Come to you on the path of taqwa, of sunnah, of ikhlas, of ihsan, ya Rabbi Kareem. Rabbana takambal minna innaka anta samiul alim. Wa tubu alayna innaka anta tubabur rahim. Wa sallallahu ta'ala ala habibihi Sayyidina Muhammad. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Bi rahmatika ya rahmar rahimin.